stuff I'm going to talk about is similar to what Sam talked about earlier, but I'm going to try and make it a bit more simple and uh, look less at the diagnosis and more of how we can help the babies ourselves and what we can do practically to help them. Okay. So these are the following topics for discussion. So we're going to look at what PPHN is, how we recognise it. We're going to have a bit of a detailed look at pre and post ductal sats monitoring because we often use those words, but don't really understand what they actually mean. Um, how we can help the baby, how we can support the family, what will happen in intensive care, a bit about nitric, and then what happens afterwards. If you do have any questions, I'll um, just throw them in the chat and if I don't see them, I'll answer them at the end. So basically, PPHN is when there is a failure of normal circulatory transition. So we normally get oxygen from our mums when we're um, the, the, the newborns will until they take a deep breath and the cords cut and then they have to start getting oxygen from their lungs and therefore blood needs to start flowing to the lungs. And sometimes what happens is the pressures in the lungs, so the blood vessels are really constricted, they don't vasodilate and therefore the blood doesn't flow very well to the lungs and therefore the babies will struggle to breathe. So who's sharing somebody's shared something here? Can you all see my presentation still? Seems to have gone. The TGA presentation came up. Shall I try and load it again? Yeah, is that is that Caroline? Are you trying to share yours early? Hi, uh, sorry, I don't know what happened then. All right. Oh, sorry, about you. Sorry, you <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Technology. Oh, let me try and find mine again. I'll be two seconds. Oh, it's all going well. <laughs> Wait till I see you, Caroline. Sorry, Matthew. I'm definitely trying <laughs> to drink. Yeah, it's there now. Thank you. Got it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so generally, we see PPHN in term babies or late preterm babies. Um, it's, a it's usually secondary, but sometimes it is primary. And it can just be just an isolated instant where you get PPHN, but it's usually secondary to another condition. And most commonly, it's Meconium aspiration syndrome. So if you get babies with Meconium aspiration syndrome, it's something like 40% of, um, of PPHN cases are secondary to Meconium aspiration. But we do see it with the hypoxic baby, the septic baby, um, with kind of genital diaphragmatic hernias, and very rarely we see it with cardiac anomalies. So what you'll get is you'll get a baby who's got RDS, which we see a lot of babies with RDS. They'll end up having a high... FIO2 requirement and sometimes you'll find that the FIO2 requirement throughout your shift will just keep going up and up and up and you're not quite sure what's going on um, something doesn't quite feel right so at that point you might want to do some pre and post ductal saturation monitoring so your pre ductals you pop your saturation monitor on your right wrist and post ductal is a uh, publish oxygen saturation on your feet um, and if you notice a gap of greater than five percent that's generally an indication that you, you, you're dealing with PPHN. Now, the gold standard to officially diagnose PPHN, the doctors will need to perform a cardiac echo because they'll, they'll need to rule out that it's not just a cardiac condition. Um, so ideally, you, you, you know, you, you would do a cardiac echo. But um, for nursing staff, we, we, one of the biggest giveaways for us is the pre and post ductal oxygen saturation gap. And I'm just going to get a bit sciencey. And we're going to go over what pre and post ductal means. So I don't know if you can see my cursor, but basically deoxygenated blood comes into the right atrium. And in the normal heart, it will go through the pulmonary arteries to the lungs and then back to the left side of the heart through the aorta to the body. Well, what's happening in PPHN is that deoxygenated blood is coming to the right side of the heart but some of it is going through the PFO, the foramen ovale, 
And this is because there's high pulmonary pressures in the lungs and blood will follow the path of least resistance. And therefore the blood thinks, I know, I'll just cut this shortcut here and goes into the left atrium. Blood goes down the left atrium to the left ventricle and then to the body. Now, what you've got happening is you've got deoxygenated blood and some oxygenated blood mixing in the left atrium. And therefore, when it gets to the left ventricle, it's, it's purple mixed blood. And that goes to the body. Now, preductal, this is the science of it. When you've got your aorta, the first branch of your aorta is called the brachiocephalic trunk. And this provides blood to the right arm and to the head. And therefore, blood that arrives from here is known as preductal. And this is because if you look here, your PDA, where your pulmonary artery meets your aorta, happens just after the brachiocephalic trunk. So in PPHN, we've got this mixed blood going to our preductal saturation monitor. But then also what happens is that blood continues to go around. But then this time you've got your deoxygenated blood coming from your right ventricle, goes through your PDA. And if you can see on my slide, it becomes even more blue does this blood. And that's essentially because you've got blood not only going through the PFO, but deoxygenated blood going through your PFO, but you've got uh, deoxygenated blood going through the PDA. And that's what's causing the gap. So the bigger, the, the higher the pressures are in the lungs, the more blood's going to shunt from the right side to the left side. And therefore, you're going to see this big oxygenation gap. And that's essentially what PPHN is and how pre and post ductal sets monitoring tells us what it is. So when we look at how we can help the baby, um, this is really alien as a neonatal nurse because we're so used to giving hardly any oxygen. We're so worried about ROP. But this is a condition which affects generally term babies. And it's a condition all to do with oxygen. So we need to be aiming high with our oxygen sats. We need to be going above 94%. Now, you'll get to a point where you can give more and more oxygen and it's not going to make your oxygen saturations any better. So there's no, no point just putting them in 100%. But you'll find a balance. But be generous and give a lot of oxygen. Don't handle your babies unless you need to. You know, they can cope with a wet nappy. Um, they can manage with a bit of, you know, I don't know, vernix on the sheets, you know, just leave them alone because it's a condition where the less oxygen they've got, the worse they're going to get and you're going to get yourself in a much worse state. And then keep the babies nice and relaxed. So... It's not a time for be having lots of cuddles with parents up and down. It's a time for parents, you know, show parents positive uh, comfort holding. Show them, you know, hold the hand, get the babies to hold, get the mums to hold the baby's hand, and you know, maybe read to them. Um, but certainly discourage, you know, lots of handling. Now, interesting in this picture, this baby's on CPAP, and I don't know about your own experiences, but I'm, I'm not a fan of CPAP at all in terms of keeping babies comfortable. Um, I, I find high flow works so much better. So that, that could be another way in which you could keep them comfy is by switching to high flow. Now, I know a lot of consultants might might still prefer CPAP, and I know in different regions we have different ideas of which baby should be on CPAP and which should be on high flow. But I, I, I feel as a general trend that certain babies prefer high flow and that it's becoming more, more common to do that. So how can you support the family? So we want to use simple terms. We, we, we're not going to be able to explain to a parent that you know about PFOs and PDAs and high pulmonary pressures it's, it's just not going to happen they're going to be in shock it's not going to have been antenatally diagnosed unless it's a diaphragmatic hernia or you know but generally meconium aspiration is not something that's going to be you, know, you can't possibly know that's going to happen at birth so parents are going to want to know a little bit of information but not very much so just saying that they've got breathing problems or the transition at birth you know has not happened as it should do and then let them ask questions and they'll and then you can go into a bit more detail and hopefully you'll have the confidence to go into more detail after listening to sam's presentation and, and this presentation so stay positive but st stay realistic like you know, it's no reason to be, to be negative but the, the realization is this is a really serious condition 
there's a, there's a great potential for ICU, uh, especially, you know, the severe cases are going to end up in ICU. And, and unfortunately, it's, I don't want to say this, but some of these babies won't, won't, won't make it, like less than 10% won't make it, but that's, you know, it's a, a significant amount, unfortunately. Um, parents might have even got a plan to go home on the same day, you know, they've come in, they've expected the baby to be fine, and then all this is going on, they're on a ventilator, they're really sick. It's a complete, you know, whirlwind for, for them it's, it's you know it's really really hard for them so they're not going to be thinking straight so if if you're at a dgh and they need to be transferred to a to an icu then just remind them you know to ring the family to get to get them some food and get them clothes and get them toiletries um can the friends help do you know if they've, have they got si siblings that need to be you know looked after can the friends help to, to look after them at leeds at the moment we've got um, visiting restrictions, like I'm sure you all have, but we only allow parents on the ward at the moment. Um, so, you know, don't send them over with all the family. Check if there's a bedroom available. We've got two bedrooms on our ward and we use them for the critical care patients. So there should be a bedroom available, especially if there's a severe PBHN. I'd be, you know, I'd be, if we would say no, I'd be surprised that there is only two rooms. So what we're going to do in intensive care, well, we're going to monitor the pre and post ductal SATs. We're going to continuously monitor the BP and the CO2. We're probably going to end up, if they get to intensive care, they're going to get intubated and ventilated. Uh, we'll, if their oxygen requirement demands it, we'll give them some nitric, we'll sedate them, may need some inotropes. And if they need an ECMO, then they have to, you know, we, we don't want to think about that. So, just to touch on these topics, in terms of a CO2 with a baby with PPHN, now normally we aim for relatively high CO2s with preterm babies. We, we, we all realise that giving less pressure through your ventilator is better for the lungs. However, with PPHN, a, a, a low CO2, so alkalosis essentially, will lead to vasodilation. So, so we need to be aiming for normal CO2s for adults, so 4.5 to 6, that kind of range. If you go any lower, you know, you, you run into problems with, with, with the brain. So you, we're not aiming stupidly low, but we're, we're certainly aiming to keep it in a tight, narrow range. And the same can be said about the blood pressure. If you can get your blood pressure high, so we aim for about 50, I mean of 50 and above, um, that's going to help to stop the shunting from the left to the right side of the heart because if you've got high systemic pressures then there's going to be less movement from the right side of the heart to the left side of the heart if, if you follow me however if you go stupidly high with your blood pressure you, you're going to end up in heart failure in which case you know there's a, so there's always a balance to these things so blood pressure mean of about 50 to 60 is, is perfect So then they get to intensive care, they're on the ventilator. Um, if you're struggling with your oxygenation, they'll get switched to uh, oscillation. And then the, the treatment that we essentially give, other than giving lots of oxygen, is nitric. So nitric is just short for nitrogen oxide. It's a colourless gas which gets inhaled and it's given through the ventilator. So it's literally a tube comes off this machine, goes into the ventilator and it's just a gas which is delivered. Uh, we always start at 20 parts per million. There's no research to say giving anything more helps. And Embrace have actually got nitric now. Um, I think they got it a couple of years ago, but they can literally give it as soon as they arrive if, if you're a DGH. So it's really, a really useful thing to have is portable nitric. So then what happens afterwards? The babies will probably need feeding support if they're meconium aspiration they're probably going to need a bit of high flow for a long time even when they're off the ventilator parents are going to be really stressed you know post-traumatic stress disorder postnatal depression are all things we've got to consider go, go, moving on and then about one in four babies will actually have long-term problems due to hypoxia during the pphn so deafness learning difficulties for that kind of thing so they will need follow-up and to be seen in clinic and that is everything I have to say. So if you've got any questions or you'd like to ask anything, uh, please feel free to say in chat.
Thank you, Matthew. That was really interesting. Yeah. Uh, how? I mean, I, I'm not a neonatal nurse. Obviously, I come from cardiac background. How common is this? You know, do you see them a lot on your unit or is it very rare or? So we, so at the LGI, we, we see a lot because all the um, babies with PBHN from across the unit that need to come to an ICU will come to the LGI. So we, we see it quite often, you know, um, we'll get you know, multiple babies a year with PPH and um, it's a really interesting condition. It's a lovely condition because the, the babies can get better very quickly. You know, if you can sort that circulation out and give them good care, they can get better really quickly. Um, but unfortunately, you know, it is a very serious condition. Um, and we have to be careful what we're doing. And if they are, I mean, I don't know whether you can get like this, the not so severe sort of side of it can it then be can they be nursed in other neonatal units as well so i presume some of you will have seen it in your unit as well is that right yeah so you, you essentially you'll, you'll have a baby who's on cpap which we we see all the time or on high flow with a little bit of an oxygen requirement um and if they're managed badly they can develop pphn but if they're managed well and you know we, we can keep them just on the cpap what the pphn will resolve but if you think of it like a cycle, the, the, the more hypoxemia, the more hypoxic the baby, the more chance you have of developing the PPHN. And it spirals and gets worse and worse to a point where they end up on a ventilator um, and they need, you know, inotropes and they need oscillation and they need nitric. So you, if it's only modern PPHN, yeah, that will, that will stay in a DGH, yeah. But it's just about, you know, stopping it getting to that point if, if possible. Thanks very much. That was really interesting. Thank you. If you wouldn't mind stopping sharing your presentation then, and then I can pop mine on. Thank you. Yeah, cool. Brilliant.